All right, thank you, Sean, and, and uh, welcome everyone. And uh, first and foremost, on behalf of Council, I want to certainly thank uh, um, each and every one of you for um, you know getting your name forward and, and uh, on an issue that uh, is is really um, uh, I think very important. I mean, obviously, with the pandemic, uh, we've come to realize how dependent we are on broadband and good access to it and for many reasons whether it's uh, um, schooling from home working from home uh, dealing with meetings uh, and, and so forth we've uh, come to realize that uh, um, it doesn't matter where in rural Ontario there's issues and, and uh, so this is uh, certainly a, uh, something that council has uh, uh, felt that it uh, as we move out of COVID and, and so forth that we start looking at uh, uh, ways and means and, and opportunities to um, expand and better um, uh, to have better broadband uh, throughout our community and, and so that uh, uh, certainly we can uh, uh, continue to um, uh, to work I, and I think that's going to be the I think the move forward is that there's going to be a lot more uh, individuals working from home I don't think that's going to be the return to, uh, uh, to your the return to work piece, uh, I think that's a wrong analogy, but, but you know, return to your home office or, or a place of work, um, there's still going to be a, a huge demand for uh, uh, for internet. So uh, and without any further ado, I certainly want to take this opportunity again on behalf of everyone to thank you for, for coming forward and, and to be part of this, uh, certainly this committee. So I'm going to start obviously with a, a little bit of a, a, you know some inter, inter, uh, introductions and, and certainly if you can give us uh, kind of a little bit of a, 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 a bio or a picture of yourselves and, and, and uh, that would be certainly greatly appreciated and, and uh, as uh, we certainly move forward and um, I, I'll certainly start by um, by basically um, not only the mayor of the community but also the warden of the county of Essex. And um, for, for uh, many of you, uh, you might know what SWIFT is, the Southwestern um, uh, Integrated Fiber Technology. Uh, that's kind of the, the brainchild of, of the uh, 15 counties in Southwestern Ontario where <clears throat> roughly about four years ago, um, broadband was becoming a real issue uh, in, into, uh, into this part of the province. And uh, the wardens of the day uh, felt that uh, it was an opportunity for us to start lobbying our, our counterparts in, in, um, in the province and, and certainly the federal government to start uh, dedicating more dollars and in, in improving that. <clears throat> and um, I really believe that the, the pandemic has really um, forced the province and, and the federal government to uh, put money uh, into uh, the, the broadband expansion. Um, so the, the partnership that uh, SWIFT was able to build originally was with Omafra, uh, the farming community, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, since then it's moved on to uh, MOI, Ministry of, of Infrastructure, uh, who are now going to be um, uh, responsible for delivering the $4 billion uh, provincial dollars on, on broadband and the federal government who included another billion this year that's about two billion in, in, in total 1.8 billion somewhere in that, in, in that range and um, we're waiting attentively um, from the province uh, they were supposed to announce at the beginning of July where and when uh, and they, they were going to uh, deliver this new uh, new program um, a little bit of SWIFT is, is that we've uh, now um, have negotiated uh, with the ISPs about 95 contracts now. Um, and it roughly represents about 22 to 30% uh, of um, additional homes. And it equates to about 67,000 homes. And as you know, there's, uh, there's about uh, 300,000 in, in the area that need to be um, um, dealt with in, in, in that corridor. Um, at the beginning, SWIFT, it, it wasn't the end-all, be-all. Uh, it was uh, strictly a beginning. 
Uh, but the good news with the program has been very successful. Uh, to date, uh, with those 95 contracts, represents about a $265 million investment. Um, and uh, out of that, we, uh, um, the provincial government, the federal government have their, uh, their dollars, which would be about half of those dollars. And the rest was uh, through uh, the ISPs, the private sector, and, uh, and the contribution, obviously, from uh, the counties, uh, the 15 counties. And then uh, there's a few... Uh, single tier municipalities involved in it. Windsor had a little bit of a piece, uh, Chatham, uh, Chatham Kent, uh, the Niagara region, and uh, the town of Caledon, just to give you kind of a flavor of where it's at. Um, so <clears throat> SWIFT has uh, been in its own way, been very successful. The unfortunate thing, it only covers a certain percentage, which is about, uh, you know, the 22 to uh, 30 percent. Uh, coverage, and uh, so we have a long way to go, including our own municipality, and that's why this uh, committee has been been formed. So enough about SWIFT and and, and certainly uh, myself, but uh, now I, I'll certainly uh, call upon uh, Councillor uh, Tanya Jobin if you can give us a little bit about yourself. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Tanya Jobin. I've been serving the community for I'm going, I'm in my third term here. So it's uh, 11 years. Um, I've grown up um, in the rural community here in Maidstone, Tecumseh. I'm also very excited to start this with all of you and take in, and the initiative that um, a lot of you have taken. Aldo and I have been in conversations over some time now. Um, so yeah, I'm just happy that we're all here together and that we're going to um, come up with some type of plan and initiatives to move this forward for our community. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, Councilor Houston. Thank you, Your Worship. I am uh, uh, Brian Houston, Councilor in Ward 4 here in Tecumseh. So uh, my ward is uh, easy row uh, down south to the tracks. Um, it's my second term, you know, here on Council. And uh, I actually grew up in rural Chatham-Kent and uh, did move into uh, Windsor-Essex, moved to Tecumseh in 2003. So um, my, my day job takes me into uh, commercial business-to-business -business, um, sales and, uh, you know, looking forward to the, you know, opportunity here to, uh, uh, you know, leverage our uh, ability um, to extend uh, internet access uh, throughout the entire community and uh, not even, uh, not only the rural component, but we've even got some uh, urban uh, pockets where we've got some challenges uh, with uh, connectivity. And as the mayor has said, uh, I, I, and, and I also have two, uh, you know, young daughters there in elementary school. And when the internet went down, and I, I have fiber, but when the internet went down, um, you know, it was quite difficult to have them uh, you know, continue their schooling. So, um, you know, uh, looking forward to being part of this and, and seeing what we can do as a community here to um, extend connectivity uh, as far as we can. Thank, thank you. Uh, Darren Drillard. <clears throat> yeah, hi, uh, as, uh, as Mayor McNamara said, my name is Darren. I'm, uh, I grew up here in Tecumseh, we moved here in 1973. Uh, grew up here, moved away did my schooling and uh, did sort of got married and then returned here to raise my own family back around 2005. It's gone for a bit and back around 2008 for uh, permanently. So I've been a, a member in this community for a long time. I've uh, been involved in scouting and the Legion and uh, other uh, community service groups here. Uh, currently I work in media. I work with uh, in radio and television media. I'm a broadcast engineer. So I hand out my background is IT and uh, IT work uh, through the background, but mostly it's, you know, fixing radio transmitters and everything. But as we found our own challenges, I, I've encountered some of these challenges myself with some of our radio transmitter sites. As you know, that the sites aren't located within townships or in the cities. Most of our sites are out in the county. And when and we do, everything is pushed via broadband now. So we've had a lot of issues where we're at the back of an end of a street and trying to get connectivity into there has always been a challenge. And I've had to work with uh, with some of the partners to bring that, you know, to to facilitate getting the, that connectivity into the, these 
very rural spots. <laughs> these are sorry, these, these very rural spots out in the middle of nowhere. So I'm hoping I can bring something at least with with my experience and what I've done to the committee and uh, and help in whatever way I can. Thank you, Darren. And I'll go to uh, to Dan uh, Rosen. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor uh, Dan Grosu. Uh, I'm uh, in the area here in the Windsor Essex area. That is since uh, '97 graduate of. Uh, the University of Windsor Computer Science uh, uh, and um, moved to uh, to Maidstone uh, a, a while back, a few years back, that is, and, and was uh, immediately faced with this uh, broadband challenge, which, uh, which brings me here uh, today. Uh, I am uh, currently uh, the uh, acting uh, uh, chief technology officer for the uh, largest media company that deals with cybersecurity. And um, I have a lot of background in networking, um, IT, uh, all this uh, good stuff that uh, I think uh, should help us uh, at least address some of the challenges that we have here locally. And I'm quite excited to be, uh, to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. All right, we'll move on to uh, Nicole Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my name is Nicole Colnett. I grew up here in Tecumseh in Lakeshore and, and moved away. And we're back here for work now. Um, we homeschool four kids and our home is up north of Huntsville and it's very difficult. We, same internet problems that you have out here in the rules. You can't get connected and you get halfway through something and it drops on you. And uh, now that schooling is going more mainstreamed online, I just, I, I know I, it's very important. I think that every kid has the access to equitable internet because it really does hurt them in their education when they can't uh, keep up with their peers, not only in the technology, even in just the finding of information. So that's why I'm interested in helping out. My husband has a background in building um, internet uh, systems. He uh, does the construction work for it. And so we're also interested in, for, for that reason. We know how much work it takes to get out to the areas and uh, would like to help push it out there. Okay, thank you, Nicole. And then uh, uh, Aldo DiNardo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay, good. Uh, so my name is Aldo DiNardo. I've been a practicing pharmacist for 27 years. I uh, recently, well, four years ago, opened Maidstone Pharmacy, which is a specialty pharmacy that services homes for the intellectually challenged mainly and the local residents of Maidstone and the surrounding area. Um, very excited to be involved with this. It's something new for me. I've never done anything like this. Um, I think uh, my experience with the internet or the rural internet situation is, is probably the poster child for, for why this, this committee needs to, to be uh, working and, and you know, working together towards some goal like this because I started with a land-based provider uh, at the pharmacy, then switch to mobile internet, then switch to line of sight, then was presented with a, a local provider that was going to charge me $300,000 to bring high speed internet to my pharmacy, wherein it was literally 200 feet uh, across the road. So, um, you know, uh, I'm just, I, I think it absolutely needs to be done. And, and my pharmacy transmits very small bits of information. And when, when my service went down, it was uh, very debilitating. So I think uh, a solid high-speed internet is, uh, is something that in this day and age, everyone should have the right to have because everything is so ingrained and, and intertwined with the internet. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Aldo. Um, now, I know we're joined as well with three um, of our uh, support staff. And, and uh, so I'll give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and, and uh, who they are so that uh, you can put a name and, and, and certainly to the face. So I'll start with uh, Margaret uh, Mizek Evans, RCAM. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, everyone. So nice to meet you all. Um, I'm the CAO for the town of Tecumseh, and I am uh, really looking forward to uh, the direction that this committee might bring uh, to a, a, a pro problem that we've had and particularly in the rural area of the town for quite some time. 
So, um, you know, the mayor's been very involved as he's outlined with uh, SWIFT and, and those initiatives, but they're not moving um, swiftly enough, I guess. And uh, we're looking for <laughs> opportunities where we can to come up with a, a, a made in uh, Tecumseh solution that we can, that we can uh, promote um, to uh, the public and the private sector and see if we can get some, some more rapid movement on, on a solution. So uh, pleased to be working with you all and uh, I'll turn it over to uh, the next one up, I think is Sean, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So Sean Firth and I've uh, been with the town about 30 years now in the last 22 of those years and the role as Director of Information and Communication Services. Also a resident of Maidstone, born, born and raised in, in the area and coming to you via a point-to-point -point connection tonight as well. So um, feel your pain and your struggles. And uh, over the years, you know, we look back when the town amalgamated in 99 and the town hall had one dial-up connection for all of us to share. So in some areas it's come a long ways in some areas it hasn't. We have had some wins uh, in the area with um, a provider going through the hamlet proper, but there's still around the hamlet and, and in the rural areas that uh, we, we still have struggles. So um, very happy that council um, approved the, the formation of this committee. Uh, I think we got the ball rolling. It came up last late last year and we had a, a report adopted by council this spring and then uh, the call for nominations and, and very much appreciate all of you putting your names in and being part of what hopefully is a, a worthwhile uh, a committee with uh, solutions for all of our rate payers. So thank you and, and nice to meet you all tonight. Thank you, Sean. And uh, last but not least, uh, Christina Hebert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Christina Hebert. I am the manager of committee and community services with the town of Tecumseh. I'll be assisting with the agendas and minutes for this committee and look forward to getting to know you all a little bit more. All right. All right, so now we've got uh, the introductions behind us. So um, the order of business that we'll need to deal with right now on the second item, and I'm going to turn um, this portion of the meeting over to Christina. Uh, and it's uh, for the terms of reference found, uh, as you know, in the communications uh, portion in tonight's agenda, we are now gonna be looking for nomination for a chairperson of this committee to be selected from uh, the seven members and uh, I will now turn the meeting over to Christina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to open up the floor to nominations first starting with chair and the appointment for uh, the chair will be for the term remaining, which will be ending November 14th, 2022. If I could have a motion to nominate the chair, please. Councilor Jobin. Yes, Christina, I'd like to nominate Councilor Houston as chair of the committee. And may I have a second? Yeah, I'll support that. Thank you. Councillor Houston, assuming you accept the nomination for chair. I do. Thank you. If I can have a motion all in favor. Opposed? Oh, a little delayed. Perfect. Thank you. That carries. And I now open the floor to nominations for vice chair ending up similarly at November 14, 2022. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, uh, I'd like to nominate uh, Councilor Jobin. May I have a seconder for that? Councilor Houston? Councillor Jobin, assuming you accept the vice chair position? Certainly, thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Excellent, that carries. Thank you very much. I now turn it over to the chair. Thank you, Christina. Um, and thank you for the nominations. Um, so the next order of business is uh, to call our meeting to order. Um, so uh, um, that is done and uh, any disclosure of pecuniary interest uh, before us this evening? Um, none and that will be noted. So I guess the first thing uh, we have is a delegation this evening from uh, Grant Street. Um, uh, Sierra and IPT product manager um, and Sean, I'll allow you to maybe introduce 
Mr. Street. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, so the, the one delegation we have in our inaugural meeting this evening is uh, a gentleman who's joined us, Mr. Grant Street, who's with CIRA. Um, almost as soon as this uh, committee was uh, getting off the ground, uh, Grant reached out. We had a very good conversation on some tools that, that CIRA can offer the town um, to, to help us identify the, the problem areas geographically within the town. Uh, so Grant, uh, without further ado, I will turn the meeting over to you and just let me know when you'd like your presentation to start and I'll put it on the screen. Thank you. Okay, Sean, if you want to put the presentation up. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair, Councillors, and Tecumseh employees and citizens. I, uh, my background is I spent uh, 35 years building networks uh, all over the world, and uh, including ground satellite stations, fiber optic networks, uh, fixed wireless, and I uh, spent years uh, assisting a small rural ISP uh, near Ottawa uh, that uh, to build their network out from a start of 10 towers back in 2003 to uh, 252 now, and they cover more than 35,000 square kilometers. So uh, uh, that's what I do for a living is, or I used to do for a living is I build networks and make them work. I can act as a resource to assist you and your uh, committee uh, and uh, my hands-on experience hopefully will be of some use to you. And uh, uh, you can ask me any question you like. There's no charge for questions. And uh, I work for non-for-profit, so there's not much of a charge for our service designer. We try to, uh, we have a, a company philosophy, just trying to uh, improve Canada's internet. Uh, and I've lived in Ontario for the last 30 years. So I understand the gap, live with it. And I have been doing my best to, uh, uh, make it better. Next slide. So CIRA is a neutral, that's a Canadian Internet Registration Authority, is a neutral not-for-profit organization, probably best known uh, as the .ca folks for web pages. You may have seen our uh, little ads on television with the, the rangers and the bears. Our focus is on helping to build a better online Canada, and we do that with security applications, grants, uh, our internet performance test, uh, which we use to uh, uncover underserved areas, which there's lots of here in Canada. Next slide, please. Sears internet performance test allows municipalities to create what we call a lander page, which is just a, a URL, just a link to uh, a site. Uh, I'll show you some uh, slides that will show you what it looks like so people can do tests. And it's, it's a portal allowing the collection of tests unique to your municipality. To date, we provided uh, lander pages that include more than 1,800 municipalities and indigenous communities across Canada. Three provinces have started province-wide rural testing as well. We have collected to date more than 1 million tests since our start uh, with IPT in 2015. And we receive an average of somewhere between 800 and 1,000 tests per day. CIRA's internet performance test is unique in that it is an open web-based service that allows everyone in Canada to both participate in and visualize what Canada's internet looks like on a map. No new equipment to connect in your home, no software, just to click on the link and do the test and then we collect the results and we provide reports on them. It records the test for ongoing analysis and reporting so Canadians can actually see if things are getting better and they can see it right on a map of your community. The, the test uses independent servers and internet exchanges located in tier one cities across Canada, the closest one to you being Toronto, with others in Vancouver, Calgary, Winnipeg, um, Montreal, and Moncton. And we're increasing that probably every, every couple of years we add one or two. Um, so all of these, uh, all of this network is maintained by CIRA. And this is as opposed to tests run by most common speed tests, which rely on connections to the closest possible server, usually on the internet service providers on network. So if you get an UCLA test or, or a test now or you know, speed test now or any of these others, what they're doing is, is quite valid. 
it will prove what their network is capable of, whereas the IPT test your connection throughout your whole internet experience um, going what we call off net to the major um, connections uh, uh, you know outside of your own uh, locality and uh, you know so you can do your banking and your uh, surfing and uh, download video streaming and all that kind of stuff uh, uh, you know that's what we're testing we're testing your ability to do all those things Finally, IPT is a quality test as opposed to just a speed test. And it looks at dozens of test parameters of everything that might affect an individual connection. It is truly a real life test. Next slide, please. The internet performance test is ideal for regional and municipal development because it provides the real life results mentioned earlier. Sarah is a trusted, neutral, not-for-profit that is independent from all service providers. The collected data can provide municipalities benchmarks to show what their internet service looks like today and measure how it changes in the future. Uh, there's also uh, private equity funding uh, projects uh, that use the IPT data uh, as a basis for engineering and budgeting municipal and other projects. And uh, uh, your CAO mentioned a few minutes ago about trying to find the the public partners out there, they are out there. The news is, is, is sad right now, and it's uh, there's a lot of deficit in coverage, but it can be made better. Uh, these companies using IPT data could provide your municipality, all of Ontario, or even all of Canada, strategic and engineered budget. It's, it's, it's tough, it's hard to do, uh, but they use many different databases to measure the gap. Uh, which IPT does for them, and then geographical and other databases to plan out exactly what it is you need and present you with options. IPT being, is also being used as a project management tool. For example, by Pick2 County in Nova Scotia, who are currently executing the largest rural project in Canada today, to prove that internet uh, improvement projects deliver what was contracted for, including uh, they include payment approval as work is completed for re the requirements that they have specified. Next slide, please. CRTC, the CRTC, Canadian Radio Tele uh, Telecommunications, has identified the minimum services all Canadians should have access to. Uh, that's 50 down, 10 up five milliseconds of jitter, 50 milliseconds of latency, 25%, 0.25% or less of packet loss. That's just the, that's the, the, the rough numbers. Uh, sorry, can you go back, Sean? Those are the rough numbers of, you know, the technical side of it, but you guys don't have to know any of that. What you have to do is just understand what the requirements are, and then we can help you measure that to see if you're getting it. IPT testing will clearly show if those requirements are met. Tests are by date and time into individual building like homes and, and offices. It identifies who the ISP is for each test and location. There is an ability for people doing a test to provide information on what services they are paying for if they choose to provide it. Next slide, please. So this is what uh, Kind of hard to read it's a little small but this is what it looks like there's a test id to prove uh, to prove there is a unique id and none of the data is being uh, manipulated as a test date geo lat and geo so latitude longitude location download speed upload speed latency packet loss as i mentioned before and uh sorry sean for some reason i must, I must have an auto change in there or something um so it tells you who the IP is, uh, the IPT is. Um, it tells you what the IP number is. And here's where I mentioned that uh, people can fill in, if they wish, what their speeds are, which you can then use to compare against what they're getting. Next slide, please. So how are things in the internet in Canada? Um, Here's how rural, or the urban rural internet comparison looks from January 2020 to April 2021. As we all know, there has been always been noticeably better service in the cities and more populated areas where internet is mostly connected by wireline services like copper, cable, and fiber. At the beginning of 2020, urban download speeds were about seven and a half times better than in rural areas. And you can see that things have been changing drastically since the start of the pandemic. 
which is right where this dip is right here. And, you know, there was so much demand on the internet that people's ability to connect went down. There was so much load on the network that people's speeds were getting a little slower and slower. Speeds in urban areas quickly increased. And again, you can see that it's in the purple here. It's, uh, it's a little up and down, but there's a gradual and significant increase because they have multiple options. They have Rogers, Bell, Telus you know, in, the, in the city, and they can very quickly ramp up their speeds to what is being offered you know, by usually just paying more money or switching providers even. Rural areas, on the other hand, remained almost flat throughout this whole pandemic. The ratio changed from urban download speeds being 7.4 times faster to more than 10 times faster today. Just as a point of reference, upload speeds not shown here have gone from 11.5 times faster in urban areas to almost 15 times faster today. For people trying to work or attend school from home, it is a discouraging reality as both speeds and other quality of service requirements that IPT tests are important in today's pandemic environment, as well as for the future equality uh, for rural Canadians. Next slide, please. So here's a quick look at Essex. Uh, they have a lander page uh, from us. Um, you can see that uh, red is bad, blue is good. Uh, red is down to zero and blue is up to 50 megabit per second. Um, and uh, what that's all about is uh, the CRTC says, well, you know, we need at least 5010 for everybody in Canada. So that's why we stop at 50. But if you hover over any of these blue dots when you're looking at your testing, uh, you'll see the actual test. So if they're getting 100 megabit per second, it'll show exactly that test. Uh, next slide, please. And here's Tecumseh. I just ran this a couple of days ago. Uh, you see the uh, index here, it's uh, less than 5.1, which is not good when you consider that the slowest speed that you can purchase in Canada is five down and one up. So it's less than 5.1, 5.1, 10.2, 25, 5, and 50, 10. These were chosen specifically because ISED has a map that shows uh, what the service is supposed to be, and we're using the same bucket so we can compare. And... Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I think you mentioned that, you know, you have problems in the urban areas as well, and there they are. Uh, there's less than 5-1 sitting there in, uh, uh, you know, your built-up area. And there's not a ton of tests yet, but as we collect those, if you choose to go forward, then, you know, we'll, uh, we'll certainly get a lot more data and be able to give you a lot more information. Next slide, please. So, public-private partnerships. Um, the... There's a, depending on who you talk to, just to provide 5010 services across Canada will cost somewhere between 30 and $50 billion. So um, there, it's, it's unlikely that the federal and provincial governments are gonna you know, belly up with that much money. Uh, so uh, the private industry has been starting to look at this to see what they can do. And there is some good news out there with some very viable options that can allow municipalities to take control of upgrading their own networks, their own internet. Like the PIC2 project that I talked about earlier, public-private uh, partnerships, or PPP, use proven funding options and experienced local operating partners to run the network. So you don't have to become experts in telecom. You know, you, you would be hiring an expert if you prove, uh, sorry, if you choose to work with uh, some of these private equity firms. Municipalities do not have to become experts or internet operators. PPP can combine applications for government funding programs as part of any uh, planned projects or focus just on government funding if that is your preference. There are many options these companies can explain to you and the choice is truly up to you and I'm more than happy to make introductions or at least guide you in the right direction. CERA's IPT data is used as part of the defining the project requirements, like I was saying earlier, and they let you decide. They'll present you with a whole bunch of options saying, okay, um, you know, this is utility-based funding over a 20 to 30 year period. that will actually generate revenue for the municipality. And then you can use that pet of that revenue to both pay off the network as well as uh, grow it and make sure everybody gets an equitable connection. Uh, these kinds of opportunities have multiple options for municipal involvement and participation that can be carefully explored and understood to allow custom design project that fits each municipality's need. 
The municipality can own part of the network or not as they, as they choose. And most important, take on a decision-making role in how best to provide internet to their taxpayers while earning revenue on a known calculated basis uh, based on a business plan agreed to by all parties. They and you will know the number of internet users for each project. So projections are very reliable, we found historically. These PPP alternatives allow municipalities to start work on upgraded networks in very short time frames, uh, literally months in, in many instances. So there are, you know, there's there's options for you out there. Um, as I said, I'm willing to take my many years of experience, and uh, I do that with uh, all of our different clients that have lander pages. And, and frankly, if someone calls us with a question, we simply will pitch in and provide what, are, what information we can. And that's my presentation. Is there any questions? Well, thank you. Uh... Mr. Street, uh, Mayor. Yeah, just on, on uh, a couple of points that uh, you brought up, uh, Grant, uh, of interest is um, some of the issues that we face with, um, uh, as you know, I chair the, the SWIFT group, Southwestern Ontario um, group uh, with the 15 wardens. One of the things that uh, when we look at the CRTC, the 5010, when you look at their grid and their mark, when we were looking at um, you know projects within all of the counties in that there are many areas within their grid where they say uh no we're not going to fund it here uh because you meet uh, the 5010. now i'm sure you must have encountered that in many other areas where we where we've had to indicate to them that your your 5010 is outdated uh number one but the mapping itself wasn't accurate enough and uh, but um, at the time dealing with uh, with the province in Umafra who were um, delivering the dollars, even uh, the federal and provincial piece, um, they basically um, handcuffed uh, SWIFT in terms of when we're dealing with the ISPs that no, you need to go in this certain area uh, because uh, they're identified under the CRTC 5010 as, yep, you know, we're going to fund that in. Uh, but for a great example of that, and I'm going to use the town of Decumsey, um, they looked at the 5010 or the so-called grid uh, from, from CRTC. They said, no, we're not going to fund uh, in Decumsey because you're covered. And we said, really? Uh, and so there's many of those areas within, within uh, the county. So that was problem problematic in, 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 in certain those terms, then certainly how we're uh, going to reach out um, to uh, to get some of those dollars. Uh, the municipality alone can't do it because some of the some of the subsidies, what we found uh, on average for one home uh, and why the ISPs are not interested in the rural areas alone is, is they need the subsidy up to four thousand dollars per household. And uh, so that was kind of the low hanging fruit. Now it's uh, some areas, uh, it's uh, six, seven to eight thousand dollars per home. And so those subsidies are very, very important. But the battle, and I'm sure you've fought those battles, uh, you know, try to convince CRTC uh, that uh, their mapping hasn't kept up with, with uh, uh, you know, with the times really. And the pandemic really exposed their, their, the vulnerability of that system. Yeah. So, you know, your comments on that. So the, uh, the CRTC and I said both report on supposed service levels. Uh, and the way they do that is the internet service providers, and that includes Bell Canada right down to uh, little Joe's Steakhouse and internet company down on the corner, they have to report uh, to the CRTC and I said on an annual basis, what coverage they have that, that's changed. And I believe it's every three years or five years, I have to submit a full uh, upgrade of the information. So they're basically taking, they being the CRTC and I said, they're taking the vendor or the internet service provider data and presenting it as factual, uh, when in fact it's, it's, it's often overestimated. Uh, 
you know, you've got a guy sitting at a computer. He's trying to say, oh, OK, well, where's all of my network? I work for Bell Canada. Uh, so they try to describe that and uh, they will report it by uh, these 25 square kilometer hexes. That's how the data has always been collected. So they say that hex is covered. And then if you look at a map, uh, it, you know, it looks like it is. Uh, but in many instances, uh, that's not the reality. Um, and so part of this, the whole solution to this is collecting that data where I showed you, if we can encourage as many people as possible to actually tell us what their download and upload speeds are, just that, uh, then we have something to work with where we can say to the CRTC, and I said, well, it's not that. If you do, app, uh, and I filed government applications for years, and there's always a way to report uh, what you think is the real data. And in this case, for the Universal Broadband Fund, for, uh, fund, for example, it is a spreadsheet uh, that actually could probably only compete, be totally finished if you went house to house in the middle of a, uh, a pandemic, which is, of course, not realistic. Uh, but all we need to do is match test results with addresses, which you have in your tax rolls. So if we have a geolocation, and you have your tax address, we can link the two and provide that detail to support your application. The challenge we're gonna run into or that you're going to run into is that uh, right now they have uh, $2.8 billion they've released into the Universal Broadband Fund. So far they've received 1,700 applications uh, worth a little over $8 billion. So not all of them obviously are going to get approved. Um, so they're gonna be selective and the uh, the person that brings money to the table has the best chance of uh, actually being able to participate and get those things. Because in the case of Bell Canada, that they'll put you know 50% into the pot. Um, and the, the challenge with that is, uh, I mean, they themselves are going to have working challenges uh, because their networks don't extend into the rural areas today, except by copper wire. And the copper wire has deteriorated to a point where you know most of it does not work very well anymore. So there's all these challenges, but there are solutions. Right now, the government is considering uh, opening up access to telephone poles to both small ISPs and municipalities. Kind of a double-edged sword because your right away will be kind of at stake here as well. And you don't want all kinds of yahoos you know, getting into the right away and, and doing who knows what. But still, uh, that will give you the opportunity to you know, use those poles if they ever pass the law. Because it's always, and the devil's in the details, um, you know, right now I've seen uh, applications for hydro poles take three years to get approved. And we just don't have that time anymore. In uh, Quebec, where I have built networks as well, they have 30 days to reply. And if they haven't replied in 30 days, you can start building. And they have no sale they, on uh, Hydro Quebec. Just you know, They'll respond probably within 10 or 15 days because they know if they don't, then people are just going to start putting up their equipment. So anyway, that's not going to help us here, but that's where the Ontario government is trying to go, provincial government. So what we need to do is, a, as you know, your committee starts getting uh, its feet wet, is to try to describe what are the areas and uh, that really need it. And you can see from the map that I showed you uh, that there's, you know, there's some pretty poor internet. So we need, we need to identify as much of it as we possibly can and then draft a reasonable, you know, have conversations with different, uh, you know, consultants if necessary. Choosing a consultant can be a challenge, um, you know, but these public-private uh, partnerships, these are private equity firms and they're big ones and, and they will fund the whole project uh, and work with you on defining uh, what that's going to look like. And I mean, they do this for buildings, they do it for sewer and water and bridges and highways. I mean, that's what utility-based funding is all about. So uh, it's a good alternative. It's not for everybody. Um, Pick two County funded their own. Sturgeon County in Alberta funded their own. In the case of Pick two County, they also had uh, their uh, the not-for-profit consulting firm called iValley. They uh, helped up apply for funding and so far, they've gotten four four point eight million dollars out of the Universal Broadband Fund, and uh, they're going after another twelve million from another source. Uh, this the, the larger portion of the Universal Broadband Fund. They may get it, they may not, but you know you're entering into an agreement where you know what your cash flow is going to be, 
and then uh, you apply for this funding and anything you get, you know, just comes off, you know, the, the, the bottom line, if you will, that literally reduces your cost. So there's ways to do this. Uh, it, you know, uh, it just, it's just finding, you know, identifying what you need to do and then working together to see how, uh, how we can put it all together. Uh, uh, Dan. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for, our, for our esteemed guests today, I think um, I wanted to sort of second the number of concerns that uh, the mayor had brought up. And uh, I took a look at the data set on the performance.ca website there and uh, looked at uh, a number of the measurements. And uh, I see... Uh, our area here being very misrepresented in, uh, in the measurements. Uh, misrepresented in the sense that uh, we find areas in Windsor where we have 728 tests with an average of 53 megabits per second download speeds. And we have an area in Maidstone, which I'm very familiar with since it's very, very close to, uh, to my residence that shows 581 tests with 183 megabits speeds. Now, anybody uh, would question why we even have this issue tabled here when your data shows that um, we have an ISP that can provide 581 test cases that show 183 megabits per second download speeds. Now I can tell you as a matter of fact that those are erroneous measurements. Those are erroneous measurements by location, by speed, because there is absolutely nothing in there that, that would generate that kind of speed. The only possibility that we would find there is that there is some equipment on a particular tower that wireless ISP uses that has that capacity at this point. Right. So the question that I have for you is how should this committee or how much should this committee rely on the data that you present? Because the data you present is crucial to us obtaining funding and to us putting the case together for the need that we have. Uh -huh. So I, where is this test data coming from? I'm sorry. Uh, this data is coming from performance.cira.ca. Okay. In, in, in Grant, I know exactly which uh, uh, test result he is mentioning. It is uh, just south of uh, South Talbot Road um, between the 11th and 12th concessions. Um, south of number three and you know west of of manning road or county road 19. i noticed that one i actually texted it to sean <laughs> um, so sean i'll let you go ahead yeah mr chair i think i know the property you're talking about so the benefit of, of, of getting a lander page is you, you can't just see the speed you also see the other data that grant that uh, Grant provided earlier, uh, what the, who their ISP is. So in that case, you know, in that area, I believe there was somebody that actually owned an ISP that lived down the road from you, Dan, <laughs> that it might have had access to some. The other, the other alternative is using your phone or mobile hotspot. I've got no speeds here uh, at my house. So if I'm using my phone as my internet and I do the, run the test, I've gotten 150 or 200. Um, so. We, we, as, as a just a Joe citizen, I don't think, and Grant can correct me, we can't get into the nitty, nitty gritty of that data point other than the speed. But if we do have the lander page, we can get the XY coordinate in addition to their provider to, to, to validate Dan's concern that, that there's no way, and I know the concession well too, it's not too far from here, and uh, there's no way they're getting that speed from a uh -huh. So, I mean, I'm just looking at the, at the .ca site, the uh, performance.ca site, and there's a lot of dark blue sitting up uh, right along the border with the United States in a pretty heavily populated area. So I'm, I'm not quite 
sure. Um, <laughs> I I know the data is accurate. Um, I uh, I've been doing this for quite some time now, and I, I'm just looking at these blue dots, and they seem to range anywhere from 45 megabit per second up to, in some cases, oh, that's a good one. So yeah, there, there there's the anomaly. Yeah, that's it. But I know in that area there was somebody that was right. affiliated with an with an ISP. Um, but but again, I mean, not having access to the data, you could drill into that on the back end and see okay, these 581 test runs. What was what were they using for their device? Was it an LTE device on the mobile yeah. network? Or, um, so I mean, uh, what I need to do is go uh, look at that one. I mean, I can look at a number of them. Um, the one thing I can tell you is if it's sitting anywhere in an area that has fixed wireless, it's not getting anything better than 5010. That's, that's the math. That's, it's just not possible. Um, you know, you're not going to get anything better than 5010 with fixed wireless. And even that is going to be relatively expensive, but not too bad. Um, and only a fiber is going to deliver a uh, hundred megabit per second or plus. So I, you know, a lot of this, um, I would have to drive the area and, uh, I, uh, and, and I can do that somewhat. I'm just looking at that one blue dot that you showed me with the 184 and it's, it's not even sitting uh, in a location where a house would probably be sitting. So, you know, I suspect somebody is, you, you know, played a game with the data. I don't know who that would be, but believe me, there are people out there that will do anything. And I will look at this and, you know, what you're now flashing up there on the red dot, that's more what I would, I would be um, likely to see in these areas. But you can see there are pockets where there's a lot of tests done and there's some blue tests just down below off Talbot Road there. That's a, that would be Essex. Um, yeah, so it's, it's quite near a populated area. Um, but even they have problems. You can see there's some good tests and not so good tests. And um, anyways, um, I'd have to look at each individual one to be able to answer that question. But I'm confident that 90 plus percent, 98 percent of this data is is blatantly accurate. As a matter of fact, this is the first time I've ever had someone tell me that it's reporting speeds too high. Uh, you know, Bell Canada and everybody else kind of hate us because we, we hold them accountable for what they're reporting. Yeah, that, that's my house, and that's probably on a good day. Mm. Dan, Dan's here somewhere, and Dan, that's probably close to what you're getting, I'm guessing. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll have to look at, drill, drill down on that one just to see, to, to, to uh, allay, allay the concerns, I think. But uh, the rest of these red ones kind of make sense. These ones probably haven't been run because we do have... Uh, mm -hmm. A cable company that goes through here now so we just haven't been run recently yeah well i'll, I'll go have a look and uh, i'll send you something tomorrow after i've had a chance to poke at it we'll see what uh, we'll see what's going on thank you thank you uh councillor jobin thank you through you mr chair um grant on that map again as well the ipt testings um there's a big section there that has none and you had stated that to obtain that information, you had to use a tax rule um, and a GIS mapping thing. Um, but however, I, I'm in that area where there's nothing tested, I would gladly uh, reach out to the neighbors along 46 there and up along the two concessions. It wouldn't be difficult to throw a flyer in or around a mailbox because some of those are still rural mailboxes, so it wouldn't be difficult to do. Or is there a link um, to some type of form or I don't know and I could even share that on our social media on my own social media we have some other groups locally in the municipality that if I can just direct people so they could submit that data um, mm -hmm. and how they find that data that way we can um, start that uh, that conversation and get that information yeah and that's a good idea uh, you know we uh, it, social media is better just because sending them a link is easier than send, you know, giving them a piece of paper and asking them to type in the, the link. It's, uh, yeah. you know, it, a bit more complicated, but, um, you know, so the fastest way to do that is, is to, um, is 
to do that electronically. Now, you know, whether you decide to go ahead with a lander page or not, if you take this experiment on yourself, uh, you know, we don't make a ton of money. We make zero money off of uh, I hear you. I hear you, know? you actually. And so, I, feel your, I feel you. Yeah. So do the testing and I will download the tests and I'll give them to you. I have no issue with that at all. Okay. And how do I provide that to get that information? Well, um, go ahead, uh, Sean, I think. Yeah, I think. So tonight was to, to, to give the committee the rundown of how the lander page would work, what data was uh, available to it. And the first part is, you know, Rome isn't going to be built in a day. And the really the purpose of this was to give it a few months between our two meetings to really get some uh, some data in uh, market uh -huh. market this like Councillor Jobin uh, expressed. We were we were playing uh, if if approved by the committee going ahead with this, uh, marketing it through all our social media channels, our website, uh, registering a domain name that redirects you to our lander page. Something simple like to come see royalbroadband.ca. Something easy to remember uh, or something catchier that the committee can come up with. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to do that. And get as much data as we can to get uh, to get yeah. this decision making and planning process going. So, uh, Mr. Chair, what I'll do is I'll send you the link for the test site. You can circulate it amongst the uh, uh, the different committee members. And uh, let's, uh, if you generate tests, I mean, we can have a look at this and just put them all together, and um, I can uh, help you uh, interpret the data. So I guess, yeah, so, so, so sorry, sorry, Mark. I mean, sorry, Mr. Chair. No, no, nope, nope, that's a fine. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, just act subsequent to that, um, again, the fee was nominal. And I guess pending uh, the anomaly here that was pointed out tonight, if the committee is comfortable with proceeding um, as discussed, um, uh, administration can take that direction uh, at this point. But I'll, let, I'll let Mark chime in as well. Mr. Chair, I think she had a question, and maybe Dan as well. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Um, just, I just had a question for our speaker uh, while he's still with us. Um, the, um, do, when you, based on your experience, you know, and, and looking in your in your crystal ball uh, with respect to uh, building these networks into the future, uh, you know, today uh, everybody's um, trying to strive for fiber and. Uh, what's but what about tomorrow? And and I know that we we've, we've been approached in the past uh, about uh, municipality building its own network or getting in um, uh, getting into a partnership with a mm -hmm. to entity to um, you know build these fiber networks and a twenty year deal and that type of thing. But uh, then 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 what? Right? I mean, is it is that going to be the the answer in twenty years, or is it going to be subsumed by something else? And will we get stuck with this network that uh, that is in our uh, public rights of ways? And uh, you know, what does the future look for yeah. that? So uh, I built the first fiber optic network. Uh, in Canada, for sure, and probably the world, between 1980 and 1984 in Saskatchewan. That fiber is still in the ground and, and working. However, the technology has, you know, as you've seen, it changes drastically. Um, and it was experimental. We, we literally took a model from the Bell Northern Research people and built a factory using that model. And... Um, they've made such advancements in fiber that my opinion is that if you have a fiber to your home, that should be the last internet you'll ever need. Because now they've gotten to the point and you can thank Newbridge for this and in, in the, uh, the way they put uh, you know massive amount of data along a single fiber, um, you will find that all they have to do now is upgrade the hardware at each end. And the fiber itself, Will be that it's like the water it just runs down the river and it's always going to be there and it's always going to you know it's all well we hope it's always going to flow but <laughs> fiber yeah it will be there forever and with the exception of a few you know occasionally someone's going to dig it up with their backhoe and and it won't happen very often but it will happen um that fiber will be solid and reliable for many years to come 
you know, really, uh, we're getting to a point now when I'm talking to uh, different municipalities is whether the question we should be asking the homeowner is, do you have a fiber connection? Yes or no. That needs to almost be the first question. And if they have it, then we got to find a way. Then we put a, plotting them on these maps with those performance um, the, the speeds that we see. If we know there's fiber there, then it's extending that existing fiber network to everybody's home. And you're probably going to have to do it in a several steps. So you'll build a hybrid network, fiber to everybody you can reach in the short time frame. And I'm saying one to two years. Uh, everybody else gets fixed wireless through a 5010 connection. Uh, but then you work at a deal with whoever you're going to do with your, whatever you're going to do with your funding, you work at a deal with them. And particularly with a private equity firm, they're going to want to make this successful because uh, they, they're going to work with you and they will want to put as much fiber in. And then you guys have got to make that decision, fiber rich or fiber poor. And then, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll probably select something in the middle where once you've got everybody hooked up that you can do in the first two years and you've got everybody else on a fixed wireless, it's giving them a minimum of 50, 10. And, and the internet, the internet uh, suppliers are, are, fire, are, are always saying up to a certain service. Well, you know, We've got, to, we've got to work out a contract where when people are putting an internet uh, connection into your community, that they guarantee a minimum speed and that we hold them accountable for that by testing with the IPT. And that will give you a pretty good idea. Uh, you'll see the fiber fill in. You'll see those hexagon turning blue very quickly and then you got to start looking at everybody that only has the 5010 and say okay this year we're going to extend into this community or this area of, of Tecumseh until it's all covered I mean and so you end up with a hybrid so start with a hybrid system and you end up with a fully fiber system takes a while um, but the, the surprising thing is the big guys I've, I've seen them over my shoulder for years the small guys are reliable, they're harder working, they're faster on their feet. Um, and we just put, uh, just before I left Storm to join Sierra, we finished putting in a 22 mile fiber run plus uh, another uh, 16 miles into every home going up the driveways and that. And we did it in less than six months. You know, it, it's doable. And by the way, we ran into solid rock all the way from the road where we started to Clayton and we were doing it in the ground and we still got that project done in six months because the small guys will persevere for you. And that's what will happen is if you get an equity firm in there, they're going to be working with local people to build an open access network where any IPT can use the backbone to supply service. And so that'll give you some competition as well. May bring down the prices. You never know. But that fiber, sorry to take such a long uh, answer there, long route to get there, that fiber network should do you for many years to come. I'll go with this, Mr. Chair, please. Um, yep. Oh, thank you. Um, so does this make any sense to be a utility? Like it seems to me that it's it's it should be a, you know, what's the difference really between hydro being available to every uh, home and fiber being available to every home? Like, it seems to me that a utility mm -hmm. model should... There's zero difference. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, there should be fiber to every home. See, remember that when the hydroelectric came, you know, came to be, uh, they're huge incentives. And, and I mean, take a look at Canada building a railroad from one coast to the other. I mean, when they decide that it's a significant investment they're willing to make for the good of everyone, they will do it or they used to do it. Uh, it doesn't happen that way so much anymore. And, and you know, the numbers I threw out there, they're not jokes. You know, I'd be, I'd be a, I don't know if it's 50 billion, but 30 billion doesn't sound wrong to me. Uh, but it's not going to be 30 billion for your township, you know, for your town, you'll be able to just, you know, you'll be able to budget it out yourself, make informed decisions about what it is you want to do, and then execute them. And you'll find uh, that it'll get done pretty quickly. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you, Grant. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Mayor, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, um, to the point where 
um, with with SWIFT where we um, when we had a lot of the, you know the tenders and that we we basically uh, push for local ISPs. We have a lot mm -hmm. of small mom and pops, uh, mm -hmm. roughly um, over uh, about fifty seven to fifty eight percent. Uh, and these are local folks and uh, local businesses. Some are, are, are nonprofits uh, within, uh, within the organization. You're absolutely right. They uh, are quick. Uh, they pivot very quickly and, and get the, you know, starting the job. But the biggest problem we're having now is, is that um, the pandemic has caused uh, great shortages in fiber. And uh, even for some that uh, uh, some of the projects, we've asked them who have been successful is like, go and order your fiber now before you even, you know, finalize the engineering. Because there's a, there's a, a lag of nine months in delivery. And so um, we're running on a, on, on, a, on a clock that we have to have our 95 projects done uh, by mid-2023. And so you lose nine months, uh, it's, it's critical. But that, uh, I, I firmly believe in local uh, ISPs. Um, the big guns, um, and I'm glad that you're talking about fiber and fiber, and, um, wireless and, and so forth should be a last resort where you can't get fiber uh, to them. A good example of that would be Pelee Island, which don't have uh, the coverage. Uh, wireless makes sense, and then, you know, and, and so forth. Uh, we stress fiber because, as you know, uh, wireless, the more you connect within that system, your speeds go down. Uh, satellite um, uh, service, uh, you know, Skylink uh, is also a stopgap, I think. Uh, so um, we've heard even from Elon Musk, who said, you know, about uh, satellite service, he says it's not the end all be all, it's a quick fix uh, to a bigger problem. And mm -hmm. uh, because the more you you hook up, uh, you know, then you have uh, issues. So fiber is 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 the end goal, uh, no question. The other yeah. point that you made, that I just wanted to raise as well, is that uh, on the urban side, not a problem with the utilities, the poles. We own the utility. Uh, the rural area, which is the vulnerable area, Hydro One owns the pole, and uh, yeah. we're working uh, through our municipal association. The Western Wardens Association, SWIFT. We've had meetings with the Minister of Energy to basically um, change uh, the ability. So, one hand, you want to give all this money for development, but then you own the utility that tells you, "No, nah, we're not interested in having your wires on our poles." And so, that's yeah. that, that, that's a point that needs to be uh, um, uh, certainly dealt with. I just what? wanted to make that point, Mr. Chair. Yeah. What's the ground like? Is it rocky or is it? Here? No problem. I think we can go underground. Okay. Uh, it's not an issue. Uh, I personally think underground is the way to go uh, and, and, uh, and so forth. But, um, uh, but anyway, I'll leave it at that. We grow a lot of crops here, so no rocks. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, there's your answer. Just bury it. Yeah. And hydro can take a hike. <laughs> Dear Mr. Chair, just um, this is just going to be some food for thought for this committee, okay? Um, mm -hmm. So I still represent the entire municipality um, and the Ward 5 residents. Some of them don't even have, as we were talking about, utility based funding. There's still a number of houses who don't have uh, town city treated water. Dan and Aldo, Aldo, just across the road from you at the corner of Manning Road and Highway 3, that new build, not connected. Dan, your entire road. And now we talk about different policies and procedures over time that have affected um, the buy-in or buy-out. It was uh, by a majority rules type of deal thing. So if we're looking at this at a utility-based funding, those are things to keep in mind that some of those residents may come back um, I may get some negative feedback in saying, well, you're advocating for this Wi-Fi service that's going to cost and you're developing a funding program and getting all these funds for this um, utility and we still don't have rural water. But there mm -hmm. will be language in there as well to help define that 
response to the residents, but just be aware of that as we go forward with these discussions. You have to, you know, keep in mind this committee, there's other things that will come about that affect yeah. how we go forward. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Jobin. Uh, uh, Dan? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, if I may uh, put forth a motion here that we uh, direct um, uh, administration through council, obviously, as our mandate states, that we create this landing page and with uh, uh, serious assistance, um, obtain the measurement data for our area. Uh, however, uh, uh, the, the only the stipulation, I guess, that we, we would get maybe uh, access to the raw data. So in, in uh, uh, conjunction with some help from CIRA and administration, we have the ability to, to run our own analysis on the, on the raw data. So we understand exactly what our areas uh -huh. of concerns are, are experienced. Yeah. yeah, all lander page clients have access to the, they can download the data all day long. And, and Sean, is that something that we require right now a motion for? I was hoping tonight that the committee would uh, give give administration uh, gu guidance, I guess, or, or authorization to proceed. I'm not sure. I'll look to, to Margaret, to Christina. Uh, yeah, sorry. maybe Margaret. The advisory Christina. committees go, but we, we, we would have money in the budget for sure to cover this if the, if the committee is agreeable. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I think uh, Sean has already indicated he's got he's got funds within his operating budget, and it, it is an operational decision. But I think he is looking for the support of the committee uh, to uh, to to go in that direction. So uh, a motion would be helpful in that regard. Okay, uh, Christina, as Dan has uh, you know kind of put forward, um, what would be the appropriate uh, motion to direct Sean then to uh, go ahead with a landing page and uh, begin collecting the data. Through you, Mr. Chair, if I can just respectfully suggest that the Rural Broadband Advisory Committee supports the um, initiative and services provided by CIRA to develop a lander page and uh, appropriate data analysis. Okay. Then- uh, And I would support that. And I, I think we, we can't move forward without having the data in front of us. To know exactly where the weak links are, and and uh, and, and start building, uh, you know, a point. Uh, I'm going to use a point of attack to deal with that particular issue. And so, um, it starts with data. Right. So uh, moved by Dan, uh, seconded by uh, Mayor McNamara. Um, any questions or further comments on the motion? Uh, all in favor. Yep, opposed, and that carries. Um, well, any further questions for um, uh, Mr. Street while he is here and available? Uh, uh, Darren. Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, with the performance um, page that we, we've all been on, and obviously I, I ran the, my own test from my house while we were, while we were talking, um, should we, actively be um, encouraging residents to to submit data to that. I think is that something that, that's going to be helpful for you in building this data, not just once the landing page is, is constructed and released, but even beginning now, should that be put out there uh, through the people we know and our own contacts and just throughout town and spreading the word and, hey, everybody go to this page and click the link. Yes, right. No matter where the data comes from, either the main page or a personalized lander page, it all ends up in your bucket. So it doesn't matter where it comes from, doesn't matter what uh, IP, what lander page we use, it'll all end up in your data. And uh, so, yes, if you can get the main page out, and again, uh, Councillor Houston, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll send you the link. Uh, of course, most of you seem to have it already. And, uh, you know, get that out there and start collecting data because it's uh, never too late. Never too early. Yep. Well, I think that's what I was suggesting. What what Sean was uh, was suggesting, yep. in in we need to get that data uh, sooner rather than later, and we need to start yep. building the data so that we have it. That's correct. Yes, I agree. Yep. And Sh Sean, is there uh, uh, any thought um, uh, given already to uh, a, a temporary landing page or a sub page within the town's 
domain to host this or, or push out for residents? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll, we've already had the beginnings of an awareness campaign formulated for this uh, pending the committee's approval. So that being said, uh, an easy way to get to the lander page and uh, uh, again, launch, launch it through our social media channels and uh, council notes and uh, like Darren said, however we can get the word out. Uh, basically the message is help us help you to, to the restaurant, to, to our residents and, and businesses. So uh, it will all be shareable and you can forward it to your, to your, uh, to your networks as well within the community. Yep. Uh, Darren? Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering for Sean, it, because of with the town site, the, the site that we have now, is it possible to create a, uh, you know, a speed test.tecumsey.ca or, or something quickly, or would that something that would take time to put together? Yeah, we would just register a domain name and redirect it to the landing page. So if, if committee members think of something catchier than I can come up with, just send, them, send me an email. I think you'll have my emails through the, through the meeting invite. If you don't, uh, I, can, I can get it to you, but. Yeah, in the next day or two or, or by early next week and then we'll get that going. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I just need the shape files and, and it's, it takes uh, takes us a, a day or two. Maybe yeah. something uh, simple and easy, Sean, is like test the .ca or to Uh So what it'll come out as being is uh, performance, uh, just a second, what it'll look like is performance.sira.ca Tecumseh is what it would probably would look like. That would be your URL. Yeah, yep. that's what we can redirect to. We can do a friendly URL and then redirect to the one that, that Grant just mentioned for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any uh, further questions for Mr. Street? No. Nope. Uh, although. I guess... Um... My question would be, uh, what's the what's the average up and down you can expect from a point to point or a satellite service? Uh, so Elon Musk, um, I've been getting hundreds of tests for SpaceX, and uh, he's doing pretty good. It looks pretty promising. Their problem is going to be that the network is not complete yet, so there's gaps. Uh, so you're you you suffer some outages throughout the day. Uh, I've seen 125 down and 70 to 80 up. It's uh, it's encouraging, but we won't know in how well it works until uh, we've had some snowstorms and um, uh, what the the network is complete and loaded. Because if yeah. you get hundreds of thousands of people, um, it might slow down. So in just just to all those comp you know on the satellite. Um, you know, and this is right from Elon Musk himself. And, uh, you know, in terms of traffic, it's just, it, 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 the best way to explain it too is that the very beginnings could be very good and very strong. It's like the 401 and you're, uh, you know, you're driving from, uh, from here. Uh, the traffic's not bad, but as you get to London, it picks up. And then by the time you hit Toronto, you're, it's a parking lot. That's, that's the reality of satellite. Satellite is a quick, uh, fix short term, uh, uh, and uh, uh, but again, it's it's uh, it's the investment, you know, and then so not to lose the focus of uh, um, of, of the short, the medium, and the long term, and in, in particular, I think that's important that, that we uh, take that into consideration. Yep. Aldo, yeah, that that, that was. That was why I asked the question with regards to, to the satellite. You know, if if the purpose of this committee is ultimately to bring fiber everywhere, you can't lose sight of the short term goal with this being as important as it is to get into as many homes as possible at a minimum of 5010. You know, I think that ultimately it it in my opinion, it, it should be a multi-pronged approach or approach or multi-leveled approach where just like with the COVID vaccine, we're trying to get as many vaccines into every arm as possible, you know, get that 50-10 into as many homes as possible with the ultimate goal of, of fiber and an amazing immunization slash internet service in a reasonable amount of time. That's all, just servicing as many homes as quickly as possible. Yep. Excellent strategy, I agree. Uh, Dan. 
you, Mr. Chair, if I may add a, a couple of bits of uh, information here as a beta tester for uh, the Starlink uh, product, I can attest that it doesn't uh, it doesn't scale well. It works well at times, but uh, at, at times it's got uh, quite uh, quite the issues to an extent where I personally haven't been able to have a, a lengthy Zoom uh, meeting over uh, over that link without uh, without it dropping. Um, yep. it, is a, it is a stock gap solution uh, that that's for sure. I don't know how scalable it would be mm -hmm. for our area, even if available or when available. Um, there are sort of radio based solutions that probably would be more scalable as a stop gap. However, you know, we have to uh, consider the cost involved in, in, in those solutions. Um, I, I personally have spent a lot of time investigating those. And although if you if you want to chat about this, we can certainly uh, exchange notes on, on this topic and I can uh, provide some further insight into this. Uh, however, fiber is, is certainly the um, the best option uh, uh, for for our area, right? And and if we want to consider um, a stopgap solution, I, I I think radio would be the next best thing. That was it. Thank you, uh, Nicole. I just also wanted to mention um, we use a satellite internet provider up at home, and uh, it's not reliable, and it's very cost prohibitive. Um, it's two hundred and eighty dollars a month for us to have and it's only 200 megs. And so I just, it's it's great if it's a stopgap solution, but if people can't afford to use it, then it's not really a solution for the, for the community. I agree, it can be very expensive. Yeah. So, um, thank you, any, uh, I guess, any closing remarks, um, Grant? Uh, just I'm available, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like a tool in the toolbox. Uh, if you have any questions at all, just email me, call me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here to help um, guide you in any way I possibly can uh, with all of my experience and whatever else. Yep. Well, well, thank you. I know I've learned a lot already about uh, um, internet and uh, connectivity and we will be sure to, uh, you know, push out the link and collect as much data as we can uh, prior to our next meeting. So, yeah, uh, see if you can get um, a local news organization, you know, electronic news to send out. We are doing a test in Tecumseh. Please submit your test and get them to give you, uh, give them the link and let it rip. And uh, Sean, I'll see if I can get that. I'm going to see if I can do a two-step process to get a Tecumseh lander page released in the next day or two, uh, and then we can add shape files later. We don't need to do everything today. We just need to have the basics and uh, uh, let's see if I can take care of that. Great. Good, thanks for it. Thank you, we'll be in touch. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time. Um, so uh, moving on, we do have uh, a couple of communications uh, here on the agenda. Um, we do have our terms of reference and uh, our procedural bylaw. Um, uh, Cr Christina, we'll have to receive uh, both of these. Yeah. And um, is there any any mention of either of these that you, you know you had in mind in, in particular? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We would be looking for a motion to receive the communication items. Sean, I believe, may touch upon the terms of reference in a bit more detail, so I would refer to him. Okay. Sean, did you want to touch on the terms of reference uh, just before we receive those? I can, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess just for our viewing audience that's out there tonight, we do have... Uh, on the agenda tonight are terms of reference and really just wanted to focus on the objectives of the committee. What, what were, these are, um, I guess how many are there here? 13 different areas that we're looking. The big thing is uh, advocacy and awareness, I think uh, is what we're, we're about. And once we get uh, through that part uh, and this fact finding mission in, 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 the, in the first few months to get uh, kind of our, our hitting the ground running here um, then at that point, we've had, I've had other uh, 
ISPs, uh, utility companies, Windsor Essex, um, a lot of interest in the community uh, uh, with this committee um, already. Uh, so we didn't want to put too much on this first agenda. We just want to get the ball rolling with the, uh, the awareness piece. But um, going forward, um, we do plan on having uh, more players at the table at these meetings. And as we, uh, as the, the committee evolves and uh, our advocacy and uh, advising our, our municipal council um, in the coming months, uh, looking forward to that. So just if anybody uh, really wanted to drill down to see what, what the committee was about and, and what our focus is going to be uh, during the term of the committee. Uh, for those that want to read it, it is included in tonight's agenda in the communication that uh, we're speaking about now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sean. And um, secondly, we have uh, the procedural bylaw. So if you were interested to learn more about exactly how the town's business is conducted, the rules that that business is conducted, those are the documents that um, you know, outline uh, really how all of the uh, business of the town um, is uh, is completed. So we won't go through those tonight, but they're there for your reading and, and viewing pleasure at uh, any time. So I guess if I could just have a motion to receive the uh, two communications in front of us, uh, moved by Dan and seconded by uh, Councillor Jobin. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Um, that carries. Um, so that really takes us, uh, we don't have any reports or unfinished business on the agenda this evening. New business uh, takes us to the meeting schedule. And um, Sean, I know it was mentioned that likely the next meeting may be called into uh, sometime in September. Yeah, I think Christina, we're trying to if Wednesdays work for everybody, I think Christina has some input on a possible date later in September. Thank you, Sean, through the chair. Uh, peers, based on sort of an early poll of our inaugural meeting tonight, keeping in mind other uh, council and committee meetings that take place throughout the month, uh, we were suggesting Wednesday, September the 22nd, if that works for everyone's schedules. I know some of the committee members have expressed a need for the evening time. Um, if the 6.30 time slot still works as well, uh, we'll be open to continuing forward with that 6.30 time slot. Yep. Uh, Darren. Yeah, I just, I do, I don't know precisely for September yet, but I probably will have a conflict with Wednesday evenings just on other uh, community work that I do. Um, but I mean, I can work around it if, if that's where the committee is going to be leaning towards. Uh, okay. Um, maybe if, uh, if there's any other uh, uh, conflicts, if we could reach out to uh, Christina and, uh, and just advise. And um, I guess we'll... Uh, yeah, I'll go with that, with that meeting for the date that she suggested for that. It's just if we're going to keep pushing forward on Wednesday evenings all the times, so it may uh, get to be bothersome after a while, I guess. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Darren. And that really takes us to the end of our meeting. So um, thank you again to uh, everyone again for your time, for your interest, uh, for the questions and uh, the conversation that we had tonight. So um, I will look now, I guess, just for a motion. I guess maybe Sean or uh, Marg, um, Mayor McNamara, any, any comments to kind of close out the meeting? The only comment, Mr. Chair, I, I just stay chair. I, you know, I think it's, it was a good meeting. I think uh, I think folks are are you know, obviously are very passionate about uh, uh, moving uh, the agenda forward, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, you know to see where the gaps are and get the data. and And I think it's uh, it's very important. Once we get that, I think we'll we'll we'll, we'll certainly have a, a better handle in terms of making those arguments uh, and looking at uh, those buckets of money that the province and feds uh, have and, and maybe those partnerships. Because I think in terms of meeting the challenges of, uh, of those dollars is, is, is dealing with uh, the CRTC and, and uh, they're, I'm, I'm gonna say they're antiquated and uh, 
really lack of really solid data to make the to make the uh, decision. And it, you know, when when I looked at the Cumsees area from uh, from the perspective of CRTC, I just kind of went just threw my hands up and said, "This, this is this this is." This is baloney, you know, it just doesn't, uh, I mean, these folks haven't got a clue. And so it, it's almost as if they look broadly in, in certain areas of the municipality and they say they target that over a, their grid. And uh, so if you meet the challenges in certain areas, then it's, it, it is what it is. And, and so it's very, very difficult, uh, you know, for us to, uh, to move forward in that, in that. So we have to make those arguments. So. And, and what's good about September coming is hopefully we'll have a better idea in terms of what the province is going to elaborate because they're they're saying fiber to every house. Well, I don't think they can do it in four billion dollars, but um, um, but anyway, we'll, that would be the challenge. And at least we'll we'll have a better idea uh, in terms of how we uh, we can leverage some of those dollars as well. Yep. Great. Um, Sean. Yeah, and just going forward, uh, this is a committee that uh, I'm, I'm not steering the ship by any means. So if you have any agenda items before next September or delegations that you think uh, as a speaker might be beneficial to, to our cause here, uh, please let me know and we'll investigate or if it's a topic you want researched. There was no admin reports on tonight's meeting and, and I just thought we'd get our feet wet with the, uh, the lander page, but uh, you'll see admin page usually discussing a topic for you to uh, vote on and, and discuss uh, with a little more, uh, I guess, meat and potatoes uh, to, to, to the next meeting. So again, if you have anything, feel free to reach out if you want something uh, looked at or brought up on the next agenda. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Dan. Uh, one additional item that I wanted to see if we can maybe do in uh, a more formal matter, I don't know, introducing this as a new business or something, um, basically establishing some sort of an action uh, item list, if you will, right, to, to direct administration as to what to look into in terms of new relationships, uh, new initiatives, uh, how we um, contact stakeholders locally here and so on. Uh, I, I feel at least for, for myself that uh, we, we are, we're getting off on a, a very good start here, but uh, I think with lack of concrete action items, uh, we will uh, we will have a hard time making uh, making headway. So I'm not sure uh, from a procedural standpoint if if this would be sort of a, a motion to introduce a new business uh, item uh, to somehow formalize a, a um, um, how, I don't know how to even phrase it a, a um, an action plan if you will. Right, that's that's in line with the with the stated objectives of the uh, of the committee. Uh, Sean, I see your hand up. Yeah, and, and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong because I usually am. But uh, these these are probably the items that will be uh, um, found on the unfinished business list. Uh, as as you give us direction to do things, uh, we give you a status. This is how it works in regular council meetings. We give you a status of uh, of, of what you've asked us to do. So I think those action items. That'd be a good place for it is under unfinished business. We didn't have any fun because it was, it was our first meeting, but Mark, does that sound like a good spot for Dan's question? Or? Sure. Um, I, through the chair, uh, I just wanted maybe a little slight nuance here. Um, I think that you're, you're bang on, Dan, with respect to an action plan. Um, I think at this point, uh, what I'm hearing Sean say is that we're kind of in the exploratory phase here in terms of uh, trying to understand the, um, you know, where the committee members are at, what they want to bring uh, to, to the advisory role. Uh, this is a committee that's going to advise uh, all members of uh, Tecumseh Council, which is the decision-making body. So I think uh, what uh, Sean is suggesting is if you have a uh, an idea or concept or uh, what have you that uh, you want explored further, we can certainly add that to an unfinished uh, business list for the committee. Uh, and uh, try to kind of uh, rally that into uh, eventually parlay that into an action plan. Um, and uh, and uh, we have 
um, three members of council on this uh, committee uh, to parlay that back to council as needs be if it if it's going to take resources or what have you right because that isn't that would be over the purview of the committee it really does need to be council led at that point in time does that help at all with uh, trying to yeah I under, understood and and, uh, and and that works thank, thank you very much okay well with uh, with that being said uh, again thank you everyone for your time um and uh interest this evening and um i will just look for a motion to adjourn our meeting councillor jobin and uh, seconded by dan all in favor uh opposed and that carries so thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful evening thank you